Hi everyone, Kim here at Olive City Homestead and today it's time for another, well, relaxing in the garden video. And this is number three in the series, which I'm really enjoying, especially right now in the middle of summer. I know it's technically the first day of summer, June 21st today, but it feels like the middle of summer when it's 106 degrees Fahrenheit at 5 p.m. But in the middle of summer, there's so much work to do in the garden, so much watering. Um, and here I'm still replanting things and planting new things and I'm harvesting already. But yeah, lots of watering early, early in the morning. So relaxing in the garden has to be something I do at another time, as in in the evenings. <laughs> and so after about 5 p.m., I can come out to my back garden where my flowers are and and some of my other things like amaranth and such. Or I can go out in the front flower garden um, because it gets shade after about 3 p.m. And finding a time when you can relax in the garden, even in the summer heat, is super important. I know it is for me anyway. In fact, you know, I kind of refuse to go into the garden between mm, 11.30 a.m. and about 4.30 p.m. It's pretty rare I'd ever go out in the garden at that time because things look so dire. When it's that hot and dry, it doesn't matter how much you watered in the morning, things look like they're they're dying. They just look absolutely destitute and I just don't want to look at them. <laughs> so I wait to go out until the evening or the next morning, you know, then they're fine. You would never know they had a problem, most of them. So that's what I do. But enjoying the garden well, that's another matter entirely. And for me anyway, I have to consciously set aside a time to do that because otherwise I'll just notice what needs to be done and start doing all those little chores, which, you know, I can enjoy my garden and orchard while I'm doing chores. I especially enjoy it when I'm watering the orchard or um, watering new seedlings or harvesting but it's a special kind of relaxation when you're doing nothing but maybe having a drink, listening to the sounds of nature like that bird. I don't know what that is, but he's certainly persistent in that one tone, isn't he? But I've got the ducks over here just filling up their pond with a little extra water, which they're super enjoying. And I like that background quacking um, or the chickens if they're nearby. It lets me wind down. Just finished making some pizza dough for homemade pizza tonight and just took a chocolate cake out of the oven because today is my son's birthday, my middle child. So I have nine kids, so he was number five. And uh, he is 27 today. And so he came over for birthday dinner and dessert. So we'll be doing that in a little while. So how has your week been? I apologize if the lighting is kind of wacky because I'm going in and out of the sun. The corkscrew willow tree that's right next to me is blocking the sun most of the time, but occasionally it wavers and the sun peeks through. Hope it's not too bad. Uh, I've had a really good week in the garden. I have had the excitement of the new seedlings really taking off and I've started planting some of them out. And some of the things like my beans that are on the fence between the uh, garden area and the chicken run and the olive orchard, I have pretty much accepted that they're never going to produce for me because the birds keep eating them. Well, the birds and or the squirrels, I don't know who's doing it, but they're doing it and they're doing it very well. <laughs> and, but I've accepted that. I have my Chinese long red noodle beans that I have been just dying to get some of and they had been getting eaten down by the squirrels but I have managed to finally replant enough of them that I've got them attaching to the trellis and starting to grow up it so I finally feel like there's hope in that regard. I've been harvesting some of my onions and a lot of my herbs and really the main reason that this week has been fun and super enjoyable is because I've learned some new things this week and I do love learning and a couple of these things I just had never heard of before which was very surprising to me because they're both areas that I have looked into. So one of the areas is gluten-free baking and gluten-free flours. So I stumbled upon a video where this woman made pumpkin flour. She harvested a medium-sized pumpkin from her garden, cut it up, 
uh, grated it in large um, chunks with a grating machine of some sort, you know, like a food processor, but my food processor doesn't grate like this one did. So I'm gonna have to look into that. Uh, and then she dehydrated the pieces and then she ground them into flour, pumpkin flour. It looked awesome. And it was really very easy to do. And my mind was sort of blown because, you know, I've made oat flour, easy as anything. And I've made almond flour. Uh, I've made a few different nut flours, but I never thought of making flour from a pumpkin. And it sort of made me think, wow, what else could I make flour from? Uh, so I'm definitely going to be trying that because I have to eat gluten-free. One of my kids has to eat gluten-free. And um, yeah, because gluten-free flour is very expensive. And I like to make my own blends anyway. And I'd love to experiment with gluten-free baking. So I am really excited about this. And I'm looking forward to trying pumpkin flour and maybe some, I don't know, zucchini flour. The possibilities really are pretty broad, I think, and I, I'm looking forward to trying them all out. So another thing I learned about this week, which I really can't believe I didn't discover when I first moved here in 2013, nine years ago. I think I've mentioned a few times that I have a large olive orchard. These olive trees were planted at the turn of the 20th century, so they're over 100 years old, and I have about 100 of them, mostly Sevianos and a few missions. And when I first moved here, I wanted to make the best use of these olives so I could hire out harvesting and sell them off um, to a larger farmer who would take them in with his produce to the um, processing companies nearby. But um, there's really been less and less of a demand for olives lately. and. They didn't want my olives after a few years. Not because of the quality. My olives are great. Just because there's so many olives in this city. This is the olive capital of the country where I live. And there's olive orchards everywhere. I mean, that is what they planted when they started this city um, at the turn of the 20th century. And so that made me feel guilty. I learned to cure olives myself which is quite the long-term process and takes a lot of work, really, if you're doing any kind of quantity. And what's crazy is that I have so many olive trees and they bear so heavily that I could harvest the olives from just one large branch and I would have way more than I could possibly deal with. So I've been wondering ever since then, you know, what should I do? Lots of people say, just rip them out, turn it into horse pasture. That's what a lot of people have been doing. I didn't want to do that. Uh, one of the main reasons I bought the property is I love the old olive trees. They have such character. But I wanted to make use of them. And so my meager attempts at curing um, a very small amount of the olives that I produce and even the small amount that I sell, it's just adds up to very little compared to how much they produce. So I discovered something new this week. I have no idea why, I never read about it before, but it is olive leaf tea and extract. Olive leaf tinctures medicinal and olive leaf tea medicinal. Uh, so good for you, so healthy, so nutritious. I'm so excited about it because it's so simple to do either one of these things. And I will do a video soon on making your own olive leaf tinctures, which are great for all kinds of health issues. Olive leaves have all kinds of antioxidants, many of which are not found in any other type of plant. They're anti-inflammatory too and antibacterial. They have been proven scientifically in many um, respected studies actually to fight against all sorts of respiratory issues. They lower blood sugar level. They lower blood pressure. Um, they've been found to be anti-cancer. So I'm just really excited to start taking advantage myself and sharing with others the benefits of olive leaves. I have a never-ending supply and making a tincture, all you need is the leaves and some vodka. Making tea, all you need is the leaves and some water. The tea is sort of a savory type tea, more like an oregano in flavor. And um, I think it's going to be great all winter. In the summer, I'm going to try it this week. 
with some of my stevia that I grow and make an iced tea with it. So yeah, really looking forward to sharing that info with you and really, you know, experimenting with it a lot myself. So tell me, what are some of your favorite herbal teas? You know, one of mine is echinacea tea. And this week I started harvesting some of my echinacea. I couldn't believe that they're growing back again on their own where I had a plant last year. I'm not sure if they're coming back from the roots or if they self-seeded, probably self-seeded, but I've got them coming up in several different locations. So I'm keeping an eye on them to see which one they do better in, which microclimate they prefer. And that's where I'm going to plant more next year. But come with me and I will show you the echinacea. They're so pretty right now, the, the purple cone flowers. And, you know, echinacea tea, all I do with it is add a little stevia. You can add honey, sugar, or drink it plain if you don't like it sweet. But when I make it with iced tea, I do like it a little sweet with the stevia. If I have it hot, I don't put anything in it except a little lemon verbena because I think they go really well together. But let's go take a look at them now. So here is one area that I've got the echinacea coming up in. It's coming up in this crate, just starting to bloom out. I always find cone flowers, just like zinnias, to be so interesting in the fact that they look so different in all their different stages of bloom. So yes, with the tea, I make it with a combination of the leaves and the petals. Very good for you. And at another time, I'll do a video on that, but very tasty. Like I said, I like it iced with stevia and hot with lemon verbena. Aren't they pretty? Yes, they are. Let's go see the other echinacea. So these echinacea came up next to my winter savory, which is also in bloom, uh, and my green sorrel, again also in bloom, and my oregano also left a flower. Isn't that pretty? Yeah, this is right next to the chicken run, which is next to the chicken's olive orchard which they go out in during the day. And it is in filtered sun all day. So, you know, half sun, half shade all day. And it seems to have done well here. This plant came up on its own. I had planted echinacea here two years ago. I don't remember if it came back here last year, but it came back on its own this year, just starting to bloom. And I have more down the row here. So right next to my massive lemon verbena bush and some scraggly walking onions I need to get out of here, there's a little pot. And there's some echinacea coming up in that. Now, maybe I planted it, but I certainly didn't plant it this year. Um, and it's coming up, and I'm sure it will bloom just fine there, too. And then we have these echinacea. They're in my stone flower border that I need to totally clean out and re, re what? rejuvenate, refurbish. But not them. They're doing fabulous. Look at that. Yeah, they're growing super well. And I have been harvesting from this particular bush all week. Another thing that I have been harvesting this week is the pluots. We've actually been eating the pluots for a couple of weeks now, but my dapple dandies, my big dapple dandies that are my absolute favorite, they came ripe this past week. So we've been eating them, a lot of them every day, and I need to finish harvesting the tree today because I'm going on a trip tomorrow. And if I leave those apple dandy pluots on the tree, even a few more days while I'm gone, when I get back, they will be decimated by the birds. The birds have only gotten to one or two of them this year. I've been super fortunate. I guess since the birds have been so busy back here eating up all my beans, they've been too busy to mess with my fruit out front, which is super nice. <laughs> you know, the whole reason I have a fruit orchard with now over 80, maybe 85 fruit trees, a few nut trees in there, uh, is because of the dapple dandy pluot. Uh, four or five years ago, I was going to the farmer's market in town every week and I was buying tons of plums and pluots. And this one that was green on the outside with just a tinge of red here and there, mostly just green, but bright pink red on the inside was absolutely delicious. I'd never had it before and I just fell in love with it and I was buying tons of it every week. And you know, after about a month, I was like, wait a minute, 
why don't I plant this tree and grow my own Dapple Dandy Blue Watts? So that was what I did. That was the beginning of my fruit orchard. I bought some Dapple Dandy Blue Watts as well as a Flavor King and a Flavor Queen and Santa Rosa Plum and a Burgundy Plum because they all cross pollinate. And yeah, I haven't looked back. I've been adding more trees every year since then and have not regretted it at all. It's been a lot of fun and of course, very delicious and healthy. So let's go harvest the rest of those pluots. All right, time to start harvesting these beauties. I see that at least one of them, a bird got to munching on today right there. Oh, and right there. Let's get the rest of these off before the birds get them. I like them when they're beautifully untouched. Although I will tell you, when I find one that a bird's been munching on, like this one, I just turn it around and eat the other side. <laughs> now when the fruits are ripe, they come right off. You just twist very slightly and they come right off. Boy, these things are big. So far I've removed 50 from the tree today. It's just loaded. I generally keep my fruit trees pruned at a six to seven foot level so that I can reach them easily. I think I need to uh, refine that to five and a half to six and a half. But I'm going to reach to get these topmost ones. Well, that didn't turn out to be hard because I just stood on the mulch in the raised bed which is a good uh, foot and a half to two feet off the ground. And that made it work just fine. These things are huge. They're bigger than a tennis ball, really big. Well, I harvested 108 Dapple Dandy Pluots just now. That is in addition to everything we've been eating all week and not counting the seven that had some slight bird damage, which I'll just cut off that little portion and we'll eat those fresh tonight. So I have all these pluots we can enjoy over the coming week. And I like to keep them in the fridge because, oh, nice and cold. They're so good. I mean, it's second only to eating it right off the tree, which I'm going to do right now. Mmm. So good. I encourage you guys, if you don't have your own fruit trees, it's definitely worth it. Pick your favorites and get started today. So yes, I am going on a trip. I talked about this a few weeks ago, but the trip did have to get postponed because first my daughter who was visiting from Hawaii got COVID. So her trip back to Hawaii with my two younger kids who were going to go visit her there had to be postponed a week. Then they went and as soon as they left, I think the day they left, I came down with COVID. And then that lasted like 10 days or so of symptoms and where I was had no energy and I was contagious. So my older daughter and I, who had planned this trip to the Mendocino Botanical Gardens, had to postpone that trip. So fortunately, we postponed it for a few weeks because as soon as I got better, she got COVID and she is just now over it as of like yesterday and we are going tomorrow. Yeah, to the Mendocino Botanical Gardens, which are fabulous. I have never been there, but I have looked through all the website and oh my goodness, the plants look absolutely amazing. I will do my best to do some filming while there, while also drooling over all the plants and, you know, being inspired and being motivated for my own garden because I want to share what I see with you guys. It supposedly is a really fabulous botanical gardens there um, on the coast of California. It's about three and a half, four hour drive from where I am inland and north. And then the next day, we're going to go to the ancient redwoods along the coast of California, which I've been there many times, but my older daughter has never been there. So we're going to go enjoy that together. My only qualm, and it is a big one, guys, the weather. I told you it was 106 here today. It's supposed to be 105, 106 tomorrow. But then it's supposed to get up to 109 in the next few days. The thing is, it's really hard to feel okay about going anywhere when I know the plants really need me here. I feel like, you know, I'm indispensable to them. I know just how much water to give them and just how to water them. And, and let me tell you, in California and probably other areas where it has a super dry, intense heat from early in the morning till late in the evening, 
the leaves don't like to get wet at all at any point in the day. So I'm very careful with how I water. And I really don't want to put all that on my 18 year old who's graciously offered to water for me. I know I'm going to get up at 5 a.m. tomorrow and water before we leave. Water really well. And I watered really well today. Normally, it wouldn't matter at all to skip a day. But with 106 to 109 degree Fahrenheit temps, uh, I don't think we could skip a day, at least not with most of the plants. There are some of the plants get in the shade by 3 p.m. If I water them real well tomorrow, I think they'll be okay. I'm going to move my seedlings that I haven't planted out yet into my covered patio area. That should help them be fine. But there will be some that I'll have her water. So she's promised me and she's like my most responsible of all my kids. So I feel pretty good about it. She's promised me she's going to get up really early before the sun is shining on the garden and water the, those areas. And we're going to do a practice run in the morning. And then when I leave, I'm going to let it go. When I leave the house tomorrow, I will put the garden in the back of my mind and not worry about it. I will assume everything will do fabulous while I'm gone because it probably will. And if it doesn't, I'll deal with that later because I know this trip's going to be worth it. And you'll see too, because I am going to do a video and share with you what we see there. So thanks for joining me today, guys, relaxing in the garden. And I hope you're taking time every day to relax in your garden too. And remember, you can create the life and the garden you want. So why not start right now. See you next time, everyone.